at one stage, uh, we'd blown up, which wasn't unusual, a two and a half litre climax up and had to change engines. Uh, one we were putting in probably wasn't much better than the one we just blew, but. Uh, <laughs> and at a place called Wigram Airfield, that was an operational airfield, they closed down, had to race over the weekend, and it was back operational on the Monday. So to save their fauna and flora, which they looked after very much, they supplied us with uh, trays to put around so the petrol wouldn't destroy the grass, that we washed the oil off the frame and the engine and what have you. And I had a mechanic called Mumbles, Mumbles, Mumbled. And I picked up the other end of the tray and we took it into the toilet, which comprised of sheet iron, hessian bag and big holes in the ground. And Mumbles poured the petrol down the big holes in the ground, which was a trough, and, and mumbled again. And I picked the tray up, and Mumbles dropped the match down. <laughs> and there was an enormous whoop. And out of the end cubicle came the biggest Maori you've ever seen, <laughs> with wedding tackle that would even shame Jackie Stewart. and. Uh, and he stood there with his backside smoking <laughs> and unbelievable. I think he thought it was something he ate. We're here at the Hyatt to pay tribute to one of the world's great racing drivers and engineers, Australian Frank Gardner. Frank is well remembered for his meticulous attention to detail, for driving standards and engineering excellence, and is also fondly remembered for his keen wit and often not too PC after dinner speeches. Now retired and living home in Australia, Frank is a world icon for motorsport, particularly for his achievements in Europe and also in Australia when he returned as a team manager. So Jackie, you and Frank go back a long way with you, his motor racing in Europe and also when you used to come out and race in the Tasman series. Can you tell me some of your fond memories of time spent with Frank abroad and back home in Australia? Well, Frank's an exceptional man because not only was he, you know, not just a competent racing driver, but a very good one. And I raced against Frank in a variety of different formulas and different types of racing cars, from open wheelers to touring cars, GT cars, sports cars, uh, Formula 2 cars. Well, Frank was, was absolutely brilliant and uh, we, we got on very, very well. Never had an argument the whole time that uh, I was with Frank. But the, uh, the thing about Frank that was unique, he'd retired from racing and uh, employed me as a driver and he prepared and, uh, and tested the cars and he actually did the testing himself. So I would only arrive up there on the Friday before the race and I'd get in the car and it had been tested, it had been run in, it had been adjusted, so it was absolutely perfect for the track. Frank was good, I met him, you know, first time would be about 25 years ago here in Australia. and. Uh, he was always helpful when I raced my little Formula Ford and uh, always sort of gave me a bollocking when I ran off the road and, uh, and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, over the years, then, uh, you know, I improved my driving and, uh, and uh, you know, then I drove for Frank at Bathurst and, uh, and it was great because, you know, we won it with Tony Longhurst and Frank was the team manager and uh, it was actually, you know, the win. But Frank always won it at Bathurst, but uh, didn't get it as a driver, but got it as a team manager. And uh... Frank Gardner um, was much loved in Europe, and in particularly in the UK. A lot to do with his dry sense of humour. He enjoyed his golf. He came up to Scotland and stayed with me, and we played golf together. But Frank was a great friend, um, as well as an awfully good competitor. They don't really make him like that anymore. He's a really unique character, a uh, tremendous ambassador for our sport, uh, uh, a real, real gentleman and, and someone that uh, Australia can be very, very proud of what he achieved overseas. Well, Frank was one of my schoolboy heroes and I followed him when, um, I remember when he bought the crashed uh, C-type Jaguar and repaired it and raced it and he was absolute hero of mine. But always a gentleman and enjoyed such a fantastic reputation, not only worldwide, but South Africa he, he was regarded as something very special. 
When you first went over to Europe and progressed all the way through to eventually Formula One, were there any times where you were able to look back on careers of other drivers like Frank to draw inspiration and strength from in your moves forward? Of course, yeah. I mean, obviously, Jack Brabham doing what he did and Alan Jones particularly in Formula One, but there was many, many people spoke to me about Frank Gardner as well uh, with all of the touring car racing and a very good single-seater driver in his day as well. So what Frank achieved over there in Europe uh, was really good for me in terms of you know some of that conf confidence you needed that actually it is possible and for some of the really difficult days and moments over there that I had uh, early on that uh, you know you get inspiration off those guys because they face the same sort of problems that I did. Was he ever able to give, give you any direct pieces of advice um, at certain times when you had got to meet up with him? Uh, one of what Frank told me once he said, mate, make sure you look after yourself because you don't make any money in hospital. So uh, yeah, he is. he's always full of good one-liners and uh, uh, yeah, he did. Uh, often I thought of that. Often I thought of you know just every now and again you have to wind your head in a little bit because there was obviously you know some very very a few dangerous moments that I had in my career where uh, you you uh, you look at uh, the experience of a wise head and um, you know it's good that. Uh, Frank was, you know, he's, he's helped so many youngsters with some you know, small bits of wisdom that he's had, but uh, makes such a big deal for them when they get over there. But he was also a very, very good engineer mechanic. Um, and some of the best work he did, in fact, was with Jack Bramble. But he did an immense amount with Lola, Lola Cars. And without Frank, I don't think the Lola program would have gone anything like it did because they became the biggest producers of racing cars in the world. When I was doing Formula 5000, Frank actually developed the best Formula 5000 car out there, which was the Lola T332. And uh, I can remember watching Frank drive Formula 5000 cars, wondering whether I'd ever be in there doing that. And, you know, a couple of years later, I was driving cars that Frank had developed. So I've always had the greatest admiration for him and his career, and a very, very career, and a driver that could have gone all the way in F1, given the right brakes. Um, but, you know, some drivers choose to have a very career. If you're not in the right Formula One car, you're better off to be driving the best Formula 5000 or the best sports car. Or, uh, it's still all about winning races at the end of the day. He was a great engineer, a great designer. He was, he was, he's good in everything. Yeah, he's even a great golfer. <laughs> you had a very unusual career because of your engineering experience as well as your ability, obviously, as a driver. How did that help you as a driver being able to engineer the cars the way you liked and really know the way you, that the cars would handle? Well, it helped then because we didn't have engineers as such. These days you've got a cast of thousands and you need thousands. Um, it's a whole different ball game. So you were just Johnny on the spot on a lot of occasions and and the big trick was to survive it all. First of all, our special guest this evening, of course, as I mentioned, is Frank Gardner. He'll be up on stage shortly. Frank had done it all and won British Drivers Awards, which didn't just mean driving touring cars, it meant driving everything. The best driver of anything in the United Kingdom. That's the award Frank Gardner won. So, very well respected overseas and it's a pedigree and a heritage that someone like Mark Webber has looked up to and used as inspiration. And please give a big welcome to Mark Webber, ladies and gentlemen. Talking about your career briefly, it's all about being ready to seize opportunities, isn't it? I mean, sometimes, as luck would have it, the opportunities just don't come. After the Mercedes debacle at Le Mans, when you thought you just had a nice passage to the top, you could have just went away with your tail between your legs and given up, but you didn't. You hung around, you got fitter and faster and stronger than ever, and when the moment came, you took it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's you know, I'll probably touch on it a little bit uh, throughout the night, I'm sure, how, how, you know, it's not easy over there. There's, uh, there's definitely, we've got a lot of fast drivers in Australia, but there's a lot of fast drivers over there as well, and uh, there's a lot more of them than there is here. So, um, you know, when you race, uh, the categories are tougher, they're more competitive, and uh, you've got to really be on top of your game, otherwise uh, you are, and also ran pretty quickly, so... Uh, I constantly look for ways to obviously keep the motivation, which wasn't too difficult for me, uh, you know, to, to constantly get there. It's a long flight home with a tail between your legs. So I wanted to make sure that I, I did get to the top because there was plenty of people down here to tell me that I wasn't going to make it. So uh, it was very, very good to arrive there. And I've done 100 Grand Prix now. Of course, I would have liked to have won some races. And uh, 
done a few of my other things, but um, I've got a few points in my bank and I hope that I can win some races in the future. Looking at Frank Gardner's career, he was one of the fittest drivers of his time. And that was a little unusual because not all of them were, were as fit conscious uh, in those days. And now it's, a, it's an important part. You're, you're arguably the fittest driver on the grid and it's, uh, it's an important thing. Yeah, obviously it was a big advantage for Frank, you know, coming from a boxing background. And boxing you learn discipline, you learn how to look after yourself. Uh, if you get, uh, if you finish second in boxing, uh, quite often you don't have a very good career. So um, <laughs> you need to make sure that uh, you can look after yourself and uh, with that comes uh, the knowledge of your own body to condition yourself for the work that he did in the cars. Uh, so that was, al along with a lot of other things, obviously he's a very, very clever man, you know, and uh, he knew how to engineer the cars and he was ahead of his time in terms of all those things. So conditioning for drivers now is, uh, He's on a very, very high level, there's no question about it. Michael Schumacher changed it and took it to another level again. He caught Senna and Prost and all those guys out. You know, they weren't up, they just were not up to Michael's level when he arrived. And, and um, so yeah, it's moved on. And uh, you know, definitely Frank was, uh, when he was bobbing around back then, it was, uh, he was definitely in good shape. It's, it's such a different world now in so many ways as we know, but in that instance and, and in, the, in the case of sheer determination, uh, and desperation and career management, things really haven't changed a lot in the last 50 or 60 years in Formula One. I know Mark has to leave us very shortly, but if you don't mind, Mark, just staying on stage for a few more moments as we welcome our, our guest of honour tonight. And please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Frank Gardner will join us on stage. Just like the old days, Frank. The girls can't keep their hands off you. I would really like to give Mark Webber an opportunity, which, which he doesn't have too often, of course, to, to ask Frank a question. Frank, what, um, in, in Europe, I suppose, or in the UK, what was the biggest and the hardest challenge that you ever faced over there as a young driver, leaving Australia? What was the, the most difficult point of your career when you were over there? Mark, you've just, you just jumped 50 years, and it's a bloody difficult. You flatter me to think I can think back that far. <laughs> I mean, I walk past our drive-in suits and I look at the exotic thing that you throw over your body and then I look at mine and if I was to walk too quickly past a couple of glow worms, I'm a light. <laughs> it's, it's to say you can't compare anything with yesterday and today, to say who was a better driver, was Fangio a better driver, was... You, there's no comparison because the eras are rolled on. The only thing I'm remiss and I occasionally cry in the bathtub about is the money involved these days. <laughs> uh, I drove for, uh, for Jack Brabham, um, and he said, well, come down and get the car organised. Where's the car, Jack? All those tubes on the wall, they're all yours. As soon as you weld them up, <laughs> you can go motor racing. <laughs> he was so generous, Jack. <laughs> yeah, I can't answer your question because there's no answer to it. It's all moved on. And if it was simple, uh, and people done some remarkable things, and I don't know who's asking the question or who's doing what. But I can remember at one stage, uh, there was a, uh, a company called Connaughts. And it's before your time, you look at me blankly. The Connaughts <laughs> were a legitimate Formula One car. They could race in the Formula One then. There wasn't a world championship. But they had a bloke called Bob Cow. Bob Cowell, amazing bloke, drove, flew the first of the jets, um, wing commander Bob Cowell. Changed his name because he had the first sex operation in the world. And he came from, don't laugh, serious. He came from, uh, from Bob Cowell to Roberta Cowell. And he drove the Connaught very well, but that didn't make any money. But he did write a book. And the book 
sold for the simple reason, and there's no young children here. The title of the book was From Knackers to Knickers and How Not to Be a Big Prick All Your Life. <laughs> it was a bestseller. I, th I thought uh, F1 these days was pretty sexy in rock and roll, Mark, but that, I don't know, I don't think there's anything in recent years that's matched that story. Well, un unquestionably, uh... well, that's why we're here tonight, because there's only one of them, isn't there? So, uh... <laughs> but the things people had to do to obtain publicity, Jack Brabham said, to me recently and I said to him, I said, Jack, don't believe we're getting famous, we're just out living them all. <laughs> Mark, wind your lot up because you've got a lot to do, I know. You're absolutely right, mate. I just, um, I do have to go uh, and, uh, but I'm, um, when it came through a few months ago, it was, uh, there was no way I was going to miss tonight to, to come and see Frank uh, and everyone else enjoy the evening. Uh, when I was about uh, 15 or 16, I started to go to the racetracks around Australia for the first time. My dad said, see that guy over there with the white little hat? Um, he's, he's a legend of our sport. And, um, you know, when you're young, uh, you don't really have, you know, you think you're pretty cool and you don't really sort of respect your elders. But um, dad really did impress upon me how, how special Frank was and what sort of career that he had and what sort of inspiration he was for uh, Australian motorsport and also for his uh, career over in Europe, uh, touring cars, obviously his Formula 5000 days against uh, and the Tasman series against some really shit hot drivers. Uh, you know, he was a phenomenal talent behind the wheel uh, and a real, real individual, uh, very determined and someone that uh, I've always uh, often thought about uh, through the junior ranks and getting to the top where I did because there wasn't many guys from Australia that made it as far as what Frank did. So, wish you all the best, mate, in the future. Cheers. Mark, good to see you. As I have said, and I've said dozens of times, you can't buy talent. A lot of people would love to, but you cannot buy talent. And it is only the tenacity when you get to a certain thing that it keeps it chap like Mark, chiselling away and earning the money and finally being around to spend it. <laughs> Mark Webber, ladies and gentlemen, thanks mate. Frank, when you, when you, I mean, you had racing success in Australia and you also had success in other sports, as Mark mentioned, boxing. Um, what, can you define what it was about motor racing that sort of tipped you towards that? Was it just the engineer? Was it the fact that you could combine the engineering with the performance side of things and it was just a, a greater challenge or what? No, I don't think so. I think uh, probably in my day, we raced, or Brabham's day, we raced because we wanted to race. A lot of the time, it's an image thing these days and they have a go at it and it gets all... It's, it's like being married for a year and then having a divorce. You didn't talk it through very well. <laughs> and the pundits on the side that said it had never worked all right. Uh, but, and racing is, is not that far. It requires, um, in Mark's case, a high degree of skill, but you're working with engineers, you have to understand the whole thing. So it's like a game of chess, you can make a move but you can make, you're only going to make six wrong, wrong moves, then nobody's interested in a hard luck story, and you're too poor by then to buy a Labrador because they're great listeners. <laughs> and uh, suddenly the game's over, over. A lot of them are gone over there, but because it hasn't fallen into the soup kitchen the way they envisaged, the Disneyland stuff, um, I mean, if they'd have driven for somebody like Jack Brabham and they read the fine print, it would have said constipated non-smoking workers only need apply. <laughs> yeah, on, on a race weekend when things weren't going quite right, there, there wasn't a lot of sleep in the Brabham garage, was there, really? It was a luxury, but you were given a very strong vice where you could clip your overalls up and doze off for 10 minutes, standing on your feet, providing you didn't leave the bench, it was all right. Yeah. 
Now, now you had, of course, an option. You, you had, as I said earlier, you, you could have persisted with Formula One. You had a brilliant offer from Ford, though. And um, in those days, you didn't have to drive Formula One to prove yourself. There were a number of other ways. Um, and, and you made a big decision. Formula One World Championship in Jack's day, not Jackie Stewart, but Jack Brabham. His first Formula One Championship was worth under 100,000. That was it. Well, people like, uh, well, moving on down the ranks with Jackie Stewart, Nicky Lauder, and then we get to the Schumachers. I mean, they wouldn't get out of bed for that sort of money, wouldn't pick up the phone. Um, it's, it's all got out of hand, the finance side, when you see the fines imposed upon the Ron Dennises and, uh, and the overheads that you have to have to run a car. I mean, we had uh, probably most of the races, myself and two mechanics. And that was a big deal, two mechanics. Can you believe it? And you had to feed the buggers as well. <laughs> yeah. Jack didn't feed you though, did he? Oh, no, it wasn't that generous. Yeah. <laughs> sure. oh, Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Jackie Stewart. <laughs> I was just about to get One, you two. up on stage to refute those horrible no, no, claims no, that were made I, I, earlier. I've come up to object. <laughs> I mean, I haven't come all these thousands of miles to be insulted. A hundred thousand? I got paid that much to go to bed. <laughs> with, with Kenny Tyrrell, no, Jackie grew up more or less in a family. He grew up as an outside observer in one of the nicest families in motor racing and they come along so rare, believe you me. He wasn't in his early thinking, loused up by politics, what you should drive, what you shouldn't drive and where you should go. He had a fatherly figure in Ken and it was a discussion always. It seemed to me, it appeared that way. Oh, that's true. Ken Till was uh, an amazing man. Uh, First of all, one of the nicest things from what Frank's just said, I, for example, I never had a contract with, Ke with Ken Till. I didn't need one. We just shook hands. Uh, I had my contract the very first year I drove from him in Formula 3, but that was, the paper was more expensive than what I got paid. Um, but after that, it was just a question of driving for Ken because I wanted to, and. We trusted each other and, I mean, it just was that of a family, as Frank's absolutely said. An amazing man and one of the people that, I, I think probably Sterling Moss had the same relationship with Rob Walker as I had with Ken Tyrrell. And that was a different relationship than Jim Clark had with Colin Chapman. It w was different. He, he trusted him in his engineering sense, uh, Colin Chapman, and Jimmy drove some great cars for Colin, but it wasn't such a close relationship as it was for Ken and I, certainly not. And uh, he just, there wasn't anybody better than him in, in those days. Well, when you mentioned Colin Chapman, I recently had to write a letter the Lotus Club was having its 40th anniversary or something like that uh, at a racetrack in Australia and they said would I write a few kind words. And I'd driven over 40 races in Lotuses which surprised me but you've got to look back over these things, you can't remember what you drove. And You're still here, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, well this is what, fast new races. I was going to say, Kevin Bartlett told me that a lot of drivers he knew had the famous Lotus Limp. Yeah. And they were the lucky ones. The, we drove in over 40 races and we had almost 40 malfunctions. <laughs> so, you know, they were a tricky old lot and, and the family relationship didn't come into it with Colin. It was um, first or, I don't think it was a discussion really. I don't know how he got on with his wife, Hazel, but I think it was much the same sort of footing. <laughs> well. On, on that subject, I'd like you both to talk briefly about, I mean, Mark went, mentioned aero as aerodynamics is so important these days. What about when they first brought in wings? 
those fragile looking things on the tops of the cars and it was all experimentation and some of it was actually not doing what it was intended to do. And, uh, and some of them actually, some of the struts would break and the cars would suddenly become slippery weapons when they were going around corners. I mean, that, that was an extraordinary period, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the early efforts were amazingly simple. I mean, to begin with, the little flippers on the side of the, the front nose cone uh, did make a difference. I mean, you did get more downforce, more, more front wheel bite. The, the most ridiculous thing was when we started to wear those biplanes uh, that really Colin brought in. And, of course, they kept breaking. I mean, Collins broke every time. I mean, the, one of the reasons I went won so many races is that uh, the, the lotuses that were in front of me very fast indeed, very seldom finished. So I chugged along at the back and won races. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I mean, I, I keep telling everybody, you know, I never forget, I did the Spanish Grand Prix. I don't think you were in it, Frank, but it was at the time when they were very fragile and they had these silly wings. And I came from sixth position in the race and won the race and never passed a car. <laughs> and That's the only way you can win from six today, yeah, though, as and, well. And, 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 you know, you remember there was a wonderful man called Pepe Villa Palermo who used to be the man with the chequered flag in Spain, wore rough, red trousers and a fancy blazer. And at the end of the race, I go up to receive the trophy, gives me a big hug and whispers in my ear, well-judged race. <laughs> So that, that, I mean, the aerodynamics were crazy and it was, you know, a wet finger in the wind. Uh, and the fragility of them was ridiculous. So that was that. Yeah, I Lotuses, you could talk about them for ages, but one that sticks in my mind is Colin decided that he'd go into the big sports cars because McLaren's just started to make their mark in America, Can-Am series and what have you. Um, so Colin built a Lotus 30, and that was quite nice. And then he built the Lotus 40, and that had 10 more mistakes than the Lotus 30. <laughs> and, uh, but I can remember at Austria finishing, and the handling slowly disappeared. But it wasn't inconsistent. You had the idea that you'd be able to finish the race. So I finished behind a chap called Mike Parks in a Ferrari uh, and would have finished there anyway because Parks was quite a talented lad. The end product was at the end of the race, the mechanics came along while I was unbolting myself and opened the door and the whole thing fell on the track. The only thing holding it together was the bloody doors. <laughs> Well, of course, Sir Jackie, you, you played a big role in, in trying to improve driver safety. I mean, I guess track safety was a big issue, and I, I suppose uh, right across the board, it was a very, very risky business, wasn't it? And, and there were too many people not coming back. Well, that was the time Frank was racing. It was the time that, well, all of us was racing. Tim Schenken down there, Van down there. It was always very dangerous stuff. We... Um, uh, Helen and I counted up one night 57 people who died that we knew well enough, not to call real friends, some of them were real friends, but others were certainly people we'd spent a time with. And it was just a horrible carnage at the time. This book I just finished doing, I say in it that I pray to God that the modern Grand Prix racing driver never feels what we had to feel in those days because so many people were being killed and it, it was just ridiculous and it was to totally unnecessary. Nowadays, of course, we've got such a tremendously safe operation. I mean, I started it, but then Sid Watkins was the, the real man for the medical side and he did so much and it needed somebody to, to carry the, the torch, so to speak, but it, it was just very bad. And you see some of those films from the past, there was never stopping a race. You know, the, the, Joe Slesser's accident in 1968 at Rouen, French Grand Prix. Um, in the Honda. In the Honda, the, the flame was right across the racetrack because the 
fuel tanks burst and caught fire, you drove through it. We must have driven through it for 10 or 15 laps. They couldn't put the fire out. And of course, you just drove through it. They never stopped to race in those days. Of course, today it would. Same thing happened with Pierre Courage's accident. Same thing happened with Roger Williamson's accident. They didn't even stop the race. You just kept going. And there was no conceptual idea about safety. And luckily, that whole attitude's changed. And we've got the best risk management of any industry or business in the world right now in Formula One. We've done, what, 13 years, 11 months, and something like seven days or 11 days since we had a fatality in Formula One. I mean, that's an unbelievable record. And we could never have thought of that in our days, Frank, because the cars were fragile, the racetracks were dangerous, and that just was part and parcel of the business. Well, Frank, of course, drove the medical car at the Australian Grand Prix up until very recently when you retired. Frank, did you start when the first, when the, in 85, when it first kicked off, or did you start? Yeah, no, yeah. I was there at the first one. Yes, yep. Sid, uh, <coughs> Sid rang up and said that what he was doing and, and, you know, would I show for him as he was getting a bit old and a bit nervous. <laughs> and, uh, and I could relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> They, they had a regular driver throughout the championship, uh, but yeah. Sid insisted on having you in Australia, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Well, I, that was it. I don't know whether just to fill in time or keep it in one piece. I <laughs> never did work that out. But for the last 10 minutes, I'd love to get Vern Schupen and Tim Schenken up on stage, please. Come up, guys, to, uh, to make a, an illustrious lineup here. Just getting back to Professor Sid and what Sir Jackie was saying earlier, Tim, I recall you telling me about a, a very awkward moment in your career when a driver was killed and, and you didn't know what was the appropriate thing to do in terms of offering your services um, as, uh, you know, whether to go and ask that team for the drive and when, whether, whether it was appropriate to do so. And this was a case that cro cropped up quite often in those days. Well, that's right. That was um, in 1970 and uh, I was driving Formula 2 and uh, that was immediately after um, Piers Courage was killed at Zandvoort. And you go through a very difficult uh, argument with yourself because I desperately wanted to do Formula 1 but to take a drive over from someone who'd been killed um, you're sort of arguing with yourself as to what you want to do. So I just took a, a deep breath and went to see um, Frank Williams and uh, asked if he'd consider me driving uh, after Piers and he agreed to that. But what was even more difficult for me, I, then I think my second Grand Prix was Monza in the same year when Jochen Rent was killed. And th that, was, that was desperate because he was a big hero. I thought he was absolutely everything. He, they used to say about Clay Regazzoni, he looks, he looks like pole position just standing around in the pits. Well, that was Jochen Rent. And uh, second Grand Prix and Jochen's accident and you had no one to turn to, you're arguing with yourself, you know, this is something that you want to do more than anything else and yet you had heroes like that uh, being killed. So it was a sad time of course and uh, you know what Jackie was talking about before about, um, what did you say, 57 people being killed. But you know Jackie, we used to think in the 70s, thank Christ we weren't racing in the, in the 50s when they just had straw bales in front of the trees. We thought we were well off. Yeah, well, actually, in the 70s, they decided they couldn't afford the straw bales in front of the trees. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we hand the mic to Vern, uh, Frank, you raced against him once in a, a special event. What was it, a touring, uh, some, some sort of um, trumped up um, touring car race, wasn't it, or something in, in England? And, yeah, uh, um, I forget the circumstances. They had to have a Formula One driver and a, uh, a touring car driver of that meeting uh, coupled together in the one car and I had uh, Francois Savert and who was quite good and uh, the winner got a Capri. Uh, or we got a Capri each, I think Francois got a Capri and, uh, and I came across Tim, I don't know whether he'd been off the course or what he'd been doing or buggerising around <laughs> and he was he was just as quick as I was, but I think I had a lap on him. 
because he'd been out talking to the spectators. And uh, I, uh, well, he was in the way, really. That's all. It, it just came about that with mud on his tyres where he'd been on the, the top bit at Brown's Hatch, he was just in the way. So I apologised to his mum and, and, <laughs> and he gave me that extra bit of road. <laughs> Tim didn't seem to think he gave me that extra bit of road, but there you are, you know, so being uh, advantageous at the time and a, and a new car come in my way, which was more money than I was likely to see that month. Um, I just thanked Tim for the donation and carried on, but Tim's a bugger to hold the grudge. <laughs> Frank, Frank, I just have to remind you, I led that whole race with you following me, and on the last lap, on the last corner, I think your foot slipped off the brake pedal. <laughs> and you gave me what we used to refer to as a Liberace. I didn't know you were musically minded until that <laughs> statement at that point in time. I mean, Francois was certainly talented. He, uh, he was a concert pianist virtually. Jackie could uh, talk about that. A really talented boy, but you know, I'm not sure about that, Tim, and I wouldn't like it to go into print. <laughs> no, you break him up, Jackie? It, it, yeah. Francois Seber certainly was an unusual man, very talented in so many different ways. He, he had the best pair of eyes in Formula One. I mean, blue eyes the size of elephant's eyes, if elephants have big eyes. I've never been able to see up that high. Uh, but uh, he, he was an amazing physique. Uh, the girls absolutely adored him. He did such a lot of damage. Uh, <laughs> Everywhere we went, it was a very sad case. Um, but Francois did play the piano very well, and I'll never forget being with a very posh woman one night, a real good looker in New York, and there was a picture of Francois up on our wall, and she said, who's that? I said, that's Francois Seve, was my teammate. And she wanted to know more about him, and I said, uh, He's a very good penis. <laughs> In my Scottish way. <laughs> and she says, really? <laughs> but it's very nice to be back in Australia. <laughs> because everybody's so subtle <laughs> about what they're saying. And it's wonderful, the language you have down here, and Frank Gardner's language, that's one of the things that endeared Frank to, to the, the British. I mean, where else in the world would you hear the terminology buggerized? <laughs> I mean, he just said it. I think, here we are, this is Frank. I'm in Australia. Well, of course. I think it's very unkind that you've abused Mr. Schenken in that fashion. I mean, I mean, he was such a gentleman on the track. He moved over for everybody. It must have... <laughs> providing, providing you're driving a bulldozer. <laughs> Bern, um, of course, you... you <laughs> you've just been able to get the mic. You, um... By the way, Bern, now you're going to be in the shit. <laughs> You looked up to, to people like Tim, of course, and those who blazed the trail when you went over re relatively late in life compared to a lot of uh, guys when you're in driving open wheelers. And they must have given you great inspiration and more than a few stories. Well, you know, Frank did, because um, I read about Frank as a schoolboy and repairing a crash C type Jaguar Everybody and going off and so racing old. it. <laughs> but Frank was my hero, and so was Tim. You know, he was the the hero in England, he was the Formula Ford champion when I went over there and uh, I remember standing with him at uh, Silverson, uh, I'd asked if I could meet him and you know get some advice and uh, first of all we were, we were looking at a Formula Ford race and uh, Tim turned to Howard and Gannon and said, he said, Christ I wouldn't like to be in there now would you, you know, and this is a year after you'd won Tim and then he proceeded to uh, advise that uh, 
if I wanted to go somewhere in motor racing, maybe I should think about prod sports. <laughs> and <laughs> I think Frank and Jackie would agree that that would take a career absolutely nowhere, which I reckon was Tim's idea. <laughs> so Jackie, um, <laughs> you, you of course have a great relationship with Australia because of that glorious Tasman series era, which I think we'll all agree could never be, unfortunately could never be repeated, I don't know. I, I doubt it anyway. Um, although with globalisation, the world gets smaller and smaller, who knows? But that was uh, uh, the start of a great relationship with Australian drivers, wasn't it? Oh, terrific. Coming down to the Tasman in those days, I would come down, there would be Graham Hill, Jim Clark, there would be Danny Hill, there would be Chris Eamon, there would be Bruce McLaren, there would be Frank Gardner, there would be Frank Matic. Um, a great lineup, uh, Spencer Martin, uh, a great lineup of Australian drivers and we, it was a great holiday because we came down to do a month in New Zealand first of all and then we came to Australia for a month, four races in each location and it was a terrific, you know, we were coming down from the cold of the winter to your summer and we just loved it, we loved, of course, it was that time of year, we loved your son but much preferred your daughters. <laughs> uh, and, and it, it was a terrific, it was a terrific time and we all travelled together, you know, we stayed, I don't know, in New Zealand, we were in the White Heron or something in Auckland, we couldn't afford to go downtown, we were slightly in the suburbs, but it was a great time and, uh, and that was where I really got to know Frank uh, properly because I'd, of course, seen him in racing in Europe, but I never quite fancied Frank that much, really. <laughs> Gloria was a different case altogether. <laughs> and really, most people felt the same way. <laughs> uh, I mean, Jim Schenken certainly felt that way. <laughs> so, so we have had very, very, very happy times. I mean, best times you could ever have, really. And the camaraderie amongst the group. We traveled together, we partied together. We, we, it was just a great time. And I think that'll go down. I mean, I know Jimmy, Jim Clark, always said that the Tasman Championship Series was the best part of motor racing he ever had, just because it was such a lot of fun. Um, it just was great fun. Jim Clark uh, mowed Leo Gagan's mother's lawn uh, once. <laughs> Um, Leo's mother thought that he was just a mechanic at the garage in Sydney when he was staying for the Tasman series and she said, I need my lawn mowed this afternoon, would you mind? <laughs> and Jimmy just went and did it. Uh, those are, uh, can you imagine Fernando Alonso uh, sitting around the paddock and me saying, Fernando, I need my lawn mowed this afternoon. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what he had to say about that. Uh, Frank, um, of course, that relationship turned, as Jackie said, you knew each other in Europe as well. I mean, the camaraderie over there, and I guess that the, the danger and the injury had a lot to do, the potential for injury had a lot to do with it as well. But there was a good relationship between the drivers generally, wasn't there? there was, some of them. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Some of them, I have to uh, recall, but things that you could do, um, outlandish stuff, actually, when you think back on it, at one stage, uh, We'd blown that, which wasn't unusual, a two and a half litre climax up and had to change engines. Uh, one we were putting in probably wasn't much better than the one we just blew, but. Uh, <laughs> and at a place called Wigram Airfield, that was an operational airfield, they closed down, had to race over the weekend, and it was back operational on the Monday. So to save their fauna and flora, which they looked after very much, they supplied us with uh, trays to put around so the petrol wouldn't destroy the grass, that we washed the oil off the frame and the engine and what have you. And I had a mechanic called Mumbles, Mumbles, Mumbled. And I picked up the other end of the tray and we took it into the toilet, which comprised of sheet iron, hessian bag and big holes in the ground. And Mumbles poured the petrol down the big holes in the ground, which was a trough, and, and mumbled again. And I picked the tray up, and mumbles dropped the match down. 
and there was an enormous whoop. And out of the end cubicle came the biggest Maori you've ever seen. <laughs> with wedding tackle that would even shame Jackie Stewart. And, uh, <laughs> and he stood there with his backside smoking. <laughs> and unbelievable, I think he thought it was something he ate. And these were, you could put an incident out of any one of these races and you could relate something like that and we'd be here till three and four in the morning and Jackie going down to see whether or not he could get an operation. <laughs> and you know what, I think on that note, <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree, a very rare opportunity to have these four esteemed sporting champions on stage. Tim Schenken, Vern Schupen, Sir Jackie Stewart, and our special guest tonight, Frank Gardner, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. So there we have it, a very memorable night with the likes of Sir Jackie Stewart, Mark Webber, and Vern Schupen all turning up to pay tribute to Frank Gardner, who is undoubtedly an absolute legend of motorsport around the world. Hope you've enjoyed tonight as much as we have bringing it to you, and we look forward to your company next time on Auto Lux TV.